OK, so if radio communication is getting harder and harder and more congested, and even at the best of times, it's very hard to get much data right. back, is there an alternative? We know on Earth we now normally, I mean, you know, back in the 1960s or 70s when I was born, <laughs> most long-distance phone calls are done by radio. Yes, via right. your, nowadays they're done under, via laser, by a fibre optic cable. Um, we can't dangle a fibre optic cable into space, but can we actually use lasers in some other way to communicate with space? Well, in fact, this is exactly what a lot of people are working on. We've found in a lot of success using lasers for all different reasons, and a lot of this work into making the laser beam on Earth nice and powerful and constrained means that it's a lot better potentially to do it in space, especially now that the technology's here and the cost. And so this is kind of the new field of what we call laser optical communications. Now optical is a, is a bit of a misnomer. Yes, we mean opticals, we can see with the color of our eyes, but it also means a little bit into the infrared. So you're not gonna be seeing necessarily these giant lasers shooting down from space for obvious safety reasons. But what it means is that instead of your big radio beam, maybe you can transmit data via a laser beam. And so this is in fact the first test right now happening with NASA uh, and the Europeans. And in fact, this is something we're gonna go see shortly uh, happening here uh, at Mount Stromlo. We're trying to test satellite relays using lasers. So we have our laser um, from a, say a satellite going to their national space station and then potentially back down to Earth. So as you said uh, in the last section, we can sometimes do these relays with radio waves. Maybe can, we can do these relays with laser beams. OK, now the one benefit of lasers is that they're a much higher frequency. That's right. And that means you can store much more data in them. Exactly. So the higher the frequency, the more data you can get in a bit of bandwidth. There's also much less in the way of interference. That's right. Uh, there aren't huge numbers of laser FM radio stations around. <laughs> um, so that, that's a major benefit. We're up here in the visible light where the frequencies are um, like a, a billion times more, which actually means you can get a billion times more data per unit wavelength. That's right. So if you're only downloading two bits per second from Mars, maybe you now increase that to a couple of megabits or even a gigabit per second. And that is a big change in potentially how spacecraft can do. So not only do we need to understand the, uh, the need for more data, but we just also have higher resolution. An image in our camera 10 years ago didn't have nearly the same amount of pixels as it does today. Yeah, so for most satellites only a while back, they would sensor the data they sent to Earth. They'd have That's some right. processor on board that would say, throw away all the unimportant stuff. So for example, the ones looking for uh, transiting exoplanets, which yep. is something you've been very much involved <laughs> in, the amount of data they take is far, far, yes. far, far more than could be downloaded. So they have to throw away 99.9% .9 of it. They, they try and be clever and just pick out the crucial bits. That's right. But this can be disastrous. I mean, the classic example is why the American satellites did not spot the hole in the ozone layer back yes. in the 70s. Um, they didn't download all the raw data. They calibrated the data on the space trough. They, they decided, we're going to measure ozone all over the Earth. Um, let's find somewhere where it's not going to change, like, say, Antarctica, <laughs> and we'll use that to calibrate everything else. And all they downloaded was the calibrated data. And so what they found was that ozone everywhere else in the world was going up. <laughs> which they didn't understand. It wasn't until some people on the ground looked up and said, actually, it's not much ozone over Antarctica. They realized that they'd been doing too much processing on the spacecraft. Uh, they weren't downloading the raw data, they downloaded only the process data, and they'd made a disastrous decision how they processed it. But it's uh, too late by that point. The data's not downloaded, you can't yeah. do anything with it. Exactly. And so if we're looking at more complex things, measurements, images, calls, whatever the case may be, you don't want to dump most of it because that actually may be the crucial bit. So you want to download as much as you can, and again, as efficiently as you can. Just imagine Earth, or Earth observation satellites. I mean, in principle, they can be taking pictures all the time as they go around, so they get nice high-resolution images of all the Earth like That's every right. few hours. But there's no way they can download that much data. Exactly. It's just not possible. And so if we look at, say, the difference between radio and laser, so here we have a little spacecraft around the moon, um, obviously not to scale, transmitting our data to Earth. Now, this would be that beam separating 
on radio waves, so leaving the moon, going to Earth. Yeah, so there's diffraction we're talking about, right. how the waves spread out. As we said earlier, that's biggest for things with long wavelengths. So for radio waves, it's quite bad because they have long wavelengths. So exactly. radio waves really spread out. But because lasers are much, 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 much shorter wavelengths, that means even with a small dish, they don't spread out as much. Exactly. And so you actually get a huge difference in terms of how much light or how much, in this case, data it is making it back to your receiver. So if your receiver is the same size, radio or laser, you're going to get vast more amounts of data on Earth. And this works the same way, whether you're transmitting back to the moon or backwards. Yes, it will still spread out a bit. That's right. Um, the, nothing can avoid the laws of physics in terms of uh, diffraction. <laughs> Unfortunately. Uh, so, but the lasers, because it's a shorter wavelength, spread out far less. So a laser beam from the moon, it might be like this big when it emits from the moon. It might be a few hundred meters by the time it reaches the Earth. That's right. But the radio beam over the same distance would be hundreds of kilometers across, or thousands even. Exactly. And so nowadays, as we talked about before, we're going to start sending humans back to the moon and Mars. Well, if we're going to be sending astronauts there and they need to send a lot of data back, they also potentially would like to make a call home occasionally, maybe some videos. You're going to need to be able to transmit a lot of data all the time. And so this is where NASA is looking towards using lasers. So again, you have Earth and Mars, not to distance the scale. Now. Normally, if you send a radio beam from Mars, you can, in fact, potentially cover the entire Earth with your little radio communication. In fact, you have no choice. You will cover the exactly. entire Earth. You can't narrow it down any more. That's right. So if you have just a little radio dish in a little spot outside Canberra, you're only picking up a very small fraction of the information being transferred. Now, a laser optical beam will be much, much better. Still big because it's from Mars but we're shortening. But it's big as in Brazil size rather than big as in Earth size. That's right. And in fact, if we do the calculation in, in beam spread, if you're sending uh, it via lasers to Earth and via radio waves, you're actually going to get something that could potentially be upwards of 100 Earth diameters, depending on the frequency. Whereas with a laser, it's a tenth of the Earth. So still big, but nowhere near what we're talking about. So this automatically means we're potentially receiving a thousand times as much data from Mars just by switching to lasers. Yes, so you just got to imagine that, uh, let's imagine you put the same power out of both. That's right. That power here is going to be spread over a thousand times. And of course, it's an area, so it's a thousand exactly. height, a thousand right. That's actually, right. The amount per unit area is going to be a million times right. less than you'd get from this. I mean, really, other benefits, is, uh, so it's not quite a million fold. Exactly. So it's not that perfectly in terms of the, the increase. But what we may actually have now is a more efficient way. Um, also, if there's something in the way, less likely to have interference either on purpose or accident in space or on Earth. And it's just becoming more possible to do this now as we're about to see. But there is a drawback. I mean, as an opt optical astronomers, <laughs> we know there are these pesky things called clouds. That's clouds right. Clouds block laser light. We were always very envious of the radio astronomers because radio waves can go through most clouds. And they can also work during the daytime. Yes, whereas the laser light does get interference, not from FM radio, but from the sun. That's right. So there are downsides. So that means, again, you have to have multiple of these stations all around the world. You have to make sure that they're spread so they're working at night. You need to find places that have hopefully not as much clouds and even water vapor in the atmosphere, which can interfere with some of the redder colors. So you may need as many or possibly more of these laser optical stations as you do radio stations or radio receivers, but maybe they can do more data downloads. And ideally, what will probably happen is you'll use some sort of combination of both. Radio is not just going to go away. There's still lots of benefits. It's also a lot more costly to build these laser uh, stations, but maybe the combination of both can improve the way we get all of that precious data from everywhere in the universe.